Hello, everyone. Welcome to the YP webinar series organized by the IEEE Geoscience and Remote Sensing Society. This is Khalid, your webinar host for today's session. Thank you all for joining in today for the session on navigating performance anxiety. This webinar will have a Q&A session at the end, and please do drop your questions in the chat box or the Q&A box. Today, we have an intriguing personality. She is a certified trauma therapist, IFS and polyvagal informed, EDMR trained, traumatic stress study specialist, educator, and life skills facilitator. She is the founder of Voice of Wellbeing, providing trauma informed and culturally responsive online psychotherapy for adults and well being consultancy for individuals and organizations. She has an extensive experience in facilitating healing and growth for people around the globe, across rural and urban communities, offering services in various languages. May it be navigating trauma, daily stressors, life transitions, or various emotional and psychological challenges of one's inner and the external world. Moving forward, let us warmly welcome her. Ms. Saira Munsaf Khan, over to you. Hi, everybody. You can hear me okay? Trying to unmute yes. myself here. Thank you so much, first of all, for having me here, folks. Uh, this is a great pleasure indeed organizing this webinar for the young professionals around. Um, I do want to set one of the lenses here around that. When I say young professionals, I'm more like um, thinking of people who are kind of newish to anything. So you could be in your 20s, 30s, 40s, regardless of the age. And yet, uh, this may apply to you. Uh, thank you for the intro. Um, I would say, uh, Pardon the glitch here in formatting. So I'm a registered psychotherapist, currently licensed in uh, Ontario and Nova Scotia. Went back to grad school here after many a years. Uh, Khalid has offered some of the intro already. Uh, so just some of these details here um, around that. Previously also licensed in Dubai. I've been in counselor education, psychotherapy, uh, psychology education as well. Uh, so, let me start by inviting everybody here with a brief check-in, uh, and let's do that around feelings, if that's okay with us. Uh, so, you have the feelings wheel here. Oftentimes, we talk about our feelings in, like, sad, mad, bad, those sorts of words. And I'm wondering if we want to take a minute to sit with um, some of our deeper feelings that might be there. Feel free to go to the center in the broader section of the wheels here. So in case some part of you is noticing some sadness, so feel free to see what else might be there in that subtle domain. Is it hurt, depressed, guilt, or like powerlessness, grief, fragility? So in the chat section, if you want to share maybe three words, or more or less, whatever feels right to you, as to what is it that you're feeling right now. And it is totally fine that, you know, sometimes a part of us may be sad, and at the same time, another part may be happy or excited. One part of us may be feeling courageous, and another feeling frustrated or overwhelmed. Feel free to listen to any or all of those. So let me hear from you as you feel comfortable. Saira, are you able to see the chat? I am looking at the chat right now. And I'm just tempted to say all of your parts are welcome here. All of your parts are welcome here.
Beautiful. Mm. And not reflecting back all of the responses, just so that, you know, you've placed them here. Stay with them and take it from there. Awesome. Thank you so much to everybody who has shared the responses right now. And also to those maybe you noticed what you were feeling and yet you didn't take the next step of like typing in the chat and sending it to the whole group. Either way is, is perfectly fine. All right. So uh, how do we go about making the best of these 60 minutes? Oftentimes this would be a place where we would explore shared agreements or what do you um what shall you expect from what this webinar has to offer and what would be my expectations from you maybe as a facilitator as to you know how do we make the best of this time and learning the collaborative work that's the length through which we are going to be approaching this and you being in the driver's seat uh, let me give a, a very simple example around that like you know <clears throat> it's like all the things that I share here, some of them may be useful for you, some of them may not, some of them may land for you right away and some of them not. And you know what personal skill set you're working with, what context you're bringing to this space, what sort of a life you're living. So that lens, that context of your own personal, um, you know, living scenario at the moment, you know that the best. You're the expert of that at the moment. And I really invite you to take the driver's seat in that sense. So this is collaborative in the sense of me offering something here that I thought could be useful for like, you know, people coming from various backgrounds of like cultures and geographies. I'm assuming we have people attending this webinar from like across the globe, different countries which have different systems that can have different kind of academic and professional systems that we're talking about. You know, when we say performance anxiety within the academic and the professional spaces, they can look very different, not just from one workplace to the next, but sometimes also from like the countries that you work in or the areas, the geographies that we work in. So really taking charge of your learning in that sense as well, um, being an active sort of engager or learner in the process. Uh, on that note, I'll segue into what I would have to say about reflection and note-taking. Uh, if this is something that feels okay to you, I would even invite you to go ahead and, you know, uh, grab something uh, that feels like a note-taking equipment to you. If you are a paper and pencil person or maybe you're like an e-note-taker, e go ahead and do that. Uh, take a few seconds, grab that for yourself. Because then again, <clears throat> maybe... Right now, um, some idea is being shared and you just want to park it with yourself. That's the, the best, you know, that you want to engage with it right now. And at a later point, you sit with yourself and you mull over it. Because when I say, you know, this is, this is going to be an immersive experience and this is going to be a journey of self-awareness, taking you to some points around impactful action, that's going to happen with that personal reflection and analysis. So take your time doing that. I do want to give <clears throat> one example here in terms of why that is important. And um, one thing that comes to mind is more like an idea of maybe some of you come from the science or the engineering background. So building bridges, let's say, or constructing a building, a lot of time is spent researching how that's going to happen before the execution or the action stage happens. And in order to make that execution or the action or the actual building, uh, you know, actual construction of the building, in order to make that successful, it is important to do the research properly. And if it, that takes like, you know, considering all the factors, doing extensive research, 
or like, you know, taking a step back uh, to have a closer look, as we say. Let's make the time to do that. In other words, slowing down uh, to be able to move faster might seem counterintuitive. But again, folks who are into a workout or more like, you know, to other sports, maybe how the heart rate uh, goes up when you um, do physical exertion. And it needs to come down to be ready again to then uh, go faster. And the more this is repeated, the less time it takes for the heart rate to come down and be ready again to go fast. So I hope that lands. If you're zoning out, webinars can have that. So I might be talking at one frequency, one tone, and you're looking at the slides, you're listening to me, and all of a sudden you find, huh, where was I? What was the last point? Um, where did I lose this train of thought? So uh, let's. Uh, I'll invite you to do two things here. So one, when you notice that you've zoned out, <clears throat> I invite you to bring your attention back with compassion. There might be other voices in the head saying like, oh, so you're here to learn something and all of a sudden you have no idea what's being talked about. That's okay. You bring your attention back with compassion and just rejoin uh, this whole group of learning in that process. And if you, you want to challenge yourself further or you feel readiness for that, <clears throat> maybe noticing what was being talked about when you noticed yourself dissociating or zoning out. And maybe parking it in that reflection or note taking that you were mentioning. And that might be helpful, helpful piece of information around self-awareness. Around this, I also want to mention before I move forward, like, okay, so if you're listening to something that you already know of, uh, and then the, you, you'll notice the voice within when that happens, like, I already know this, I already know this. Again, an invitation is to note it, listen to it, we'll respect it. Yes, you already know it. And then going back into the driver's seat and seeing, all right, where can you go from there? Because uh, in the context in which this is being brought up, there might be a new perspective that comes up for you. If you actually stay with the information, stay with uh, whatever is uh, under discussion. So beyond the point of what you already know, see something else might pop up. Um, and maybe there's a technique or an exercise that you have already done. Uh, try digging deeper if um, you feel readiness for that. And when we do that, uh, let's also place this out there. When we're trying to work with themes which are either new or difficult, or there is some like overwhelming or a difficult experience from the past associated with it. Uh, there can be activation that you notice in your body. Yes, we are here to manage the anxiety, and yet it is very common uh, to be finding yourself feeling that anxiety or activation all over again uh, when uh, such topics are probed, because again, these are um, oftentimes close to our heart and soul. These things are important to us. You know, as they say, uh, we would rarely ever be anxious about something that has no importance in our life. Oftentimes it is things that we care about. So when you notice that activation, please take care of yourself. Check with yourself how that looks like for you. Does that mean taking a break? Does that mean stepping away? Or does that mean parking it again in your reflection? Uh, make your choice, the agency again. You, you take the driver's seat. Also, we briefly hit upon this already, but personalized facing. Not everything is for everyone at one point in time. For some people, uh, what they may be looking for at the moment are strategies that fix things in the moment, right? And that's okay. Uh, feel free to take those away from this interaction. For some people, what might feel useful is, okay, how do I go about creating a lifestyle change? like a relatively long-lasting sort of a change that is ingrained in your day in, day out. All right, let's 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 hone in on that. Let's zoom in uh, for that uh, when you're paying attention or taking away your reflection or note-taking. That could be your takeaway. And for yet others, 
it might feel important that they need a deeper dive into patterns and building new self-awareness or building new relationships with their own like voices and parts within. And if that feels right to you, well, yeah, let's use the space to do that and maybe beyond this as well. All right, so uh, segueing into uh, what does anxiety look like? Let's take a few seconds to look at this image. I've quoted the source here on the side if you wanna um, you know, look at it directly. So does this look familiar? Um, are some of these feelings, is, are some of these experiences uh, like the ones you might have experienced in different scenarios, academic or professional. So mind racing, thoughts all over the place sort of a thing, or one thought popping up after the next. You're feeling dizzy, disoriented, lightheaded, the vision strange or blurry, uh, not being able to sleep or wanting to sleep a lot. Either way, difficulty in swallowing, sometimes like pressure around the throat or the uh, neck area even. Changes in your breathing, breathing fast and shallow, uh, feeling breathless, trying to catch uh, your breath, heart racing, palpitations, nausea, lack of appetite, sweating, shivering, restlessness, and like not feeling the legs are going to hold you or you want to just run away. Um, and sometimes feeling like this is coming from nowhere. It's, it's just all of a sudden it's there. So just a, uh, just the openness or sharing that these experiences are very common in anxiety as it is experienced by many people, um, normalizing an attempt to normalize that. And yeah, it does feel like um, in some of, um, like, you know, uh, slides further, we'll try um, hitting upon um, or like trying to see like some of the places where these fears or dread might be coming from. And yeah, yet in the moment, it can feel like that no idea uh, where was that. And if there is more, feel free to park that with you here. Like, you know, for you, the anxiety might look um, even differently than uh, what's mentioned here. Um, another point that I um, do want to share here before we uh, move to the next point is uh, keep your, again, you know, your personal tracking is something that's going to happen for you. So um, also keeping your sort of options open here, as we see like, you know, anxiety can manifest in so many different ways. <clears throat> the flip side of that is, well, then, then you have as many uh, pathways to start working on it. So um, feeling breathlessness, well, maybe something can be done with regards to the breath to start taking care of it. So I'm just gonna leave that here as, one of the things that we are going to come back to later as well. <clears throat> All right. Um, this takes us to one of the most important points, I would say, even though I have a hard time choosing uh, which one to call the most important, but I really feel excited about sharing this one with you here. So most of us start from the green box uh, that you notice here. This visual is um, sharing like a natural cycle of competence here that anyone would go through in order to learn something or in order to engage in the learning process, let's say, because um, the green box talks about unconscious incompetence, which is we might be at a place where at some point in time we are unaware of a certain skill in that we lack the proficiency in that skill. Um, so that, that might be the starting point for some of us. And <clears throat> for that to be okay of a starting point, um, I say this uh, with a bit of an emphasis and slowing down around this point, because uh, these pointers and some of the other ones that I'll be covering through like the next um, three stages of this, they do at times become a factor in <clears throat> having expectations of our own selves, which maybe don't uh, serve the cause of taking care of the anxiety or um, that being shared with us from outside, like, you know, uh, you being okay uh, with not knowing something and recognizing 
that, well, yeah, I I do lack proficiency in this skill. And it's, it's just a natural first step of that process for any human being for that matter. So from there on, if, once the awareness has been developed and that skill seems to be important for you to learn, <clears throat> the conscious incompetence is the next stage uh, that you go to where you're aware of the skill, uh, but you're not yet proficient. So this is you being okay with being a beginner. This is you having comfort in actually specializing maybe and ultimately having what we'd call a beginner's mindset even. Or having a mindset that allows you to be open to learning, being at stage one, not being great at something, um, allowing ourselves to be in the discomfort of not being at the top of the game. Uh, and just for now, if that is something that you struggle with, I would invite you to imagine or visualize if that seems a possibility uh, to hold it in ourselves the thought that, yeah, I'm a beginner at this. I'm not at the top of the game for this. And how that feels in your body. Check in with yourself how that feels in your body. Maybe, again, going back to, you know, the visual that we saw, the different parts of the system, the soul, the nervous system, the body that gets impacted when we experience anxiety. So, yeah, and I'm not yet the expert of this. Uh, and... Maybe I'm going to get it right when I make my first attempt of learning it, or maybe not. So, you know, the whole idea, I might, I might not. And <clears throat> how do you feel towards this process? How do you feel towards yourself as a person or that part that is yet um, at the beginning stages of the learning, in that learning process? Uh, so developing that capacity to hold, um, and I would say kindness, in the process for self and then by proxy for others. So um, let's let's see how that um, connects the dots for you. So as we go to this conscious incompetence stage, um, the uh, pink box that you might be able to see. So you're aware of the skill, you're not yet proficient. That means then you're trying to move to the conscious competence, the yellow box, where you're able to use the skill, but only with effort. So in between these two stages, as you can well imagine, what might be happening is you're constantly making attempts <clears throat> again and again to be better at something, which is the practice stage maybe, or the trial and error sort of a learning stage. So every attempt won't be successful. This is where you'll be making mistakes um, and learning from those. Um, so how is the feeling towards that? How's, how's the awareness that, yeah, I, I, I'm, I didn't get that right in the first attempt. Um, so if um, slowing down and focusing on this, um, you know, is something you find useful, I would say, you know, uh, take this as your one of the reflection takeaway points for yourself. Uh, you would ultimately move to the conscious competence. Um, everybody has their own pacing around it. Um, I do want to make like a larger systems comment at this stage, though. Uh, having kindness for your own self and having capacity to hold those feelings as you're making those mistakes and going back to trying again. Practice, repeat, practice, repeat. People around you in your academic settings and in your professional settings would also be noticing that. And how you go through that process of like going from the stage of not being competent consciously to being consciously competent. And I just want to leave this with you as one of the long-term goals for some of you, maybe if you hope to be like um, leaders at some point in time. And most, most of the uh, people do end up becoming that one way or the other, uh, like when you're working with teams, when you're working in groups, uh, even in university, and then later on at your workplaces, uh, when you have kindness for your own self and by proxy, then you're able to extend that to others for going through this learning process. Uh, I wonder if that, uh, if you get recognized for that ultimately, and if those are the kind of people that we like having in our teams. 
that your values align with. And if those are the kind of leaders that people feel comfortable working with, like, you know, the ones who understand um, that there is a learning process involved. And um, let me not uh, skip the uh, fourth stage here. So yeah, most of um, you, for many of the skills, um, you stay at it, you stay at it. Um, the blue box, you see unconscious competence. So performing the skill becomes automatic. It's almost like the master who uh, sometimes can't even recall um, how did you learn it to begin with. A typical example given is that of driving a car over the years. And it can be there for so many other uh, skills, even some softwares like uh, I, I don't know if I, sh I should be saying that given like how rapidly things are changing um, in this day and age. But yet there are a few things for which one ultimately can become unconsciously competent, like the expert and master of it. You kind of don't really consciously think about it as you're doing that. Um, however, I, I would say like as much uh, of an ideal state as this might look like, uh, there, are, there are chances of this becoming a stagnant place sometimes. So... Uh, bringing the consciousness back into that competence and upskilling yourself constantly, you know, as they say, upskilling your mistakes at times, uh, that also is very helpful. And we want to keep in mind that these things can happen in a cyclical sort of a way. Um, so the scenarios and the situations, and we'll, we'll get to it at a later point as well, the scenarios and the situations can bring us back to a stage that might supposedly seem like an earlier stage uh, of your competence level. And that's that's uh, perfectly common and uh, natural. So uh, I will definitely, I am looking at these questions alongside as well. And this is gonna be answered, um, but not for sure, very important one. Uh, how do we remain consistent? Around this note, I do want to take some time. Uh, this is a bit of a deeper dive. So folks stay with me around this learning process. So um, again, I uh, I wonder where you grew up. I wonder where you went to school for, because we're talking about academic and professional competencies here. And most of us would have started from schools somewhere. And um, homes actually, um, somewhere in the globe. Shaming around the learning process, shaming around making mistakes. So noticing what are our developmental learnings. You might want to call it trauma. You might want to call it just difficult, overwhelming experiences. But is it familiar to you where you go take a math exam and you're like, you know, uh, if you don't have 100%, um, you might be given this feedback. Oh, you got 90 out of 100. What happened to the 10 that you lost? Uh, and wherever you're attempting something, uh, you're making a mistake or you're lacking behind in something and uh, you get asked about what couldn't be achieved, uh, what couldn't be done rather than uh, celebrating what you could. And I wonder how many uh, of us grow up with that sort of an experience. Kids are really not born knowing uh, that they're incompetent in anything. They're told as a part of being brought up. Uh, constantly like pointing their attention, drawing their attention to, oh, so no, you don't know how to do this. That's how it is done. In other words, of sorts for that. So the harsh external critic uh, can become a, a harsh inner critic over time. So it's like the voices from outside ultimately can become the voices from inside as well. So uh one of the takeaways, if possible, if you feel um, you're at that stage, noticing how you feel uh, when you struggle, when you're not um, doing 100% and yet you're doing 60%, 70%, 90%, how do you feel towards that? And is there a chance to changing that from frustration and hopelessness to that of compassion and curiosity? Our educational systems um, are important here to be named as well. So where sometimes people um, skip the learning process or where oftentimes students are chasing the praise because uh, um, the glory um, is for the person who's 
done the best uh, oftentimes in these systems. Progress, uh, I mean, I do notice it is being celebrated more and more and yet not everywhere. So not wanting to be found out, making a mistake, uh, you know, the aggressive macho culture as well, where performance is more important than future potential and willingness to learn. So while the title itself says for the webinar, Navigating Performance Anxiety, it really is an invite to um, give the spotlight or the highlight to this openness to the learning process, to this openness and willingness to learn. And the cycle is the same for everybody. So I do want to address some of the thoughts that can come related to this. Like, you know, am I am I ready enough? Am I worthy enough? Um, I feel like an imposter. So these things can happen again when we've had similar developmental experiences, some of them we have named, and there is a discrepancy between externally assessed competency and the internally experienced competency. So oftentimes with such a mindset or such an experience, you would feel the relief at the end of or completion of a task rather than satisfaction when you have completed a task or um, inability to carry over any sense of achievement to the next situation. So maybe you attain uh, or do well in one scenario and um, that courage and confidence doesn't get translated into the next scenario or you're longing to talk about the discomfort with the fear of being called weak or unstable. You know, it, it keeps us uh, from doing that. Just sparking this, uh, sharing this out there that uh, these things are commonly experienced and, <clears throat> you know, um, there, there needs to be really an, um, at systems level change as well. Uh, I'm not going to put all the onus on people who have grown up. Uh, like um, I, I wish there is a larger uh, systems level awareness. And yet, while I name that, I will keep bringing this back as well. You know, the concept of like the circle of influence, the circle of control. So there can be larger pieces of the work which are not directly in our control. Maybe in some, some of you do have influence for that. Some of you don't. Um, and yet there there might be pieces where something can be done. So yes, sparking and naming those as well. And yet, again, going back into the driver's seat for the little bits that we can do. Um, all right. Uh, I believe this might be sufficient for this. And with this, I segue into... Some of the scenarios. So the first one here is interviews, and I'm trying to address like a few more. Uh, some of the things that I'll speak about will sound like what we call strategies for in the moment fix. And again, a couple of points with each of those scenarios I do want to share about like, you know, uh, the diving deeper into those patterns and all and see uh, which one seems more useful to you in the moment and what you might want to place in your long term action plan. Because again, my expectation is that you're actually carving that out for yourself as we uh, go through this webinar. So um, the STAR method or the T-STAR method, you prepare. Uh, this is, uh, let me give a context here. So for this, uh, the idea is how do you show up or how do you respond to interview questions in a way that you end up uh, giving that ex giving that impression of uh, knowing or having the competency that they're looking for. So oftentimes, like a question in an interview is rooted into a certain skill set uh, that the employer is looking for or the organization is looking for, a competency that they're looking for. So um, seeing this from that lens, listening to that question from that lens, and um, I'm going to use uh, maybe just for um, making it a little um, uh, difficult, let's say, uh, rather than asking a positive questions, let's, uh, you know, positively, let's stick to maybe tell me about a time you failed. And if some other question seems more useful to you right now, uh, you can imagine that as we go through this. So um, you want to keep it story-like. 
So even though the question is, tell me about a time you failed, and this is one of the typical questions asked. And if you do a quick Google search, you'll be um, able to see like, you know, a, a standard uh, list of questions that typically um, the organizations do ask. So um, see what your answers might be. So the preparation also includes uh, that bit there. Uh, tell me about a time you failed. So this is a situation. Think about the situation. So the STAR method, the first one being situation, provide context and background. Um, our customers complain. Or this could be, um, I do want to say this right here at this point, that this STAR method actually can also come in handy for folks who don't have a lot of professional like employment experience yet. Because this situation, task, action, results, this is a sort of a flow that you can actually reflect back and pick from your interactions from your academic life as well. Because such situation, like going back to the question, tell me about the time you failed, this sort of a scenario might have been experienced even during your school education time. And maybe it was an individual task or a group task, or it was some extracurricular, you know, um, enrichment activity, any of those. So don't limit yourself to thinking about just the internships or just the paid work. Uh, maybe helpful to boost um, your own like sort of inner confidence around showing up for the interviews so that you're not uh, worried about like, oh, so how do I get, you know, the um, question, like the dilemma where it's like, if I don't get a job, where do I get that experience from? And yet, by engaging with this method, you might be able to demonstrate uh, you having a competency or having a skill while maybe you haven't had a paid job experience around that. So what was the situation in which you thought you failed and yet we're keeping it story-like. We are keeping it like, you know, the lens is the growth mindset lens, competency oriented, which means we go back to that image of like, you know, the competency learning process. Um, so this is more like, what did the situation offer you in terms of learning and doing it better the next time, if that makes any sense uh, here. So um, you, you might want to like, you know, think back around your own, own scenarios. So the T is the task. What was the problem? What were the challenges that you faced? And action is explain what you did. How did you go about um, doing something, if anything? Because action can be a choice to do something or a choice not to do something as well. Um, and then <clears throat> results. What was the outcome? Uh, what happened to the situation? What was the impact of the action that you took? And because this is like asking about telling a time you failed, I would, again, um, highly recommend sharing with the people, even though they haven't asked explicitly, what would you do differently in the next scenario so that your growth mindset and your learning competency-oriented mindset is visible to them um, in that uh, situation. Another something, uh, now this is for folks who uh, might be struggling with, um, why would anyone give me this job? I, I don't deserve it, uh, maybe, so many other people are better than me. Maybe so many other people have it easier than me. Maybe um, many other people just went to better schools or, uh, you know, like there, there can be a lot of worries which are rooted in real experiences. It's, it's not just thoughts, quote unquote. They are real experiences for people. Um, and yet, if be like if you have openness for this, maybe flipping the lens uh, can be of help. What is the value? you can bring to the organization. So right before you're like, you know, about to show up for an interview, if it, if it seems helpful to you, instead of thinking like, why should I? Like if you take the focus, like externalizing the anxiety for a moment and like trying to offer flipping the lens here, um, this, is, this is an opportunity to build a mutually beneficial relationship maybe. So there is something that the organization needs, actually. There are competences and skill sets that they're looking for. And that's why the job ad is there. So uh, what what is it that you can offer? And I would say at this point, if um, you might have heard of uh, Joe Harry Window, um, if that feedback around strength is not available from within, that's OK as well. Uh, Feel free to go to your colleagues or to your classmates, even if you don't call them friends, or go to um, people around you and ask them, 
about your strengths. So outsourcing the kindness, um, if it's not available from within right away, that's that's okay as well. And then uh, see if that changes anything around again, how you experience the anxiety in your body and how maybe you're better able to offer as compared to better able to ask right away. And when the anxiety settles a little, um, there can be more room uh, for it to be a conversation that is um, building around building mutually beneficial relationship. Some people benefit from taking it as a conversation rather than an interview where there is a huge power dynamic uh, out there. It is it is still there. I, I still want to name it, not um, miss it. Um, yet some people benefit from taking it as a conversation. You know, I'm, I'm there to talk about this. I will go back. Okay, so meetings with supervisors. Um, what are we discussing here? Uh, a, I am um, not sure if I should be, or like, you know, imagine that this is any authority figures. Uh, for some of you, a couple of things that I do want to name here is uh, people with experiences which are not the most ideal with authority figures, very common to be experiencing terrible anxiety, a lot of anxiety in your body as you approach meeting the supervisors. Uh, what is it or what are a couple of things that I want to name here that could be a part of your circle of control, which is um, maybe one of them taking ownership of the visibility, uh, that is the value that you bring the work that you have done. Um, instead of thinking the, oh, that person should know, they're my supervisor, or they're my leader, they're my boss, they should know what I'm doing. Oh, maybe they have a gazillion other things on the table and maybe, yeah, a good leader or an ideal leader or a supervisor should know. And yet, what is it that you can do um, here? Um, is, is it something that you can do with his conveying to the person? that these are the things that you're doing, these are the things you're working on, this is the progress you have made. So making sure that your progress and your efforts, it's visible in the space. And again, approaching the work, especially um, if it's like, you know, your young professionals and these are your maybe PhD supervisors or um, something. So um, coming up as a collaborator or a team player, uh, making it kind of easy uh, to work with and yet like holding your ground. I hesitate using that word. And yet like, you know, imagine what are the qualities of a person who's very collaborative, who's, who's more of a team player, who keeps the other person posted in terms of what's happening and um, invite um, guidance when it's needed. Um, I don't want to name it again, you know, people who are sometimes um, in their school, age, the school days or the college university days, um, like the top of the class, oftentimes um, they're labeled as like just knowing all, all the time. And it keeps them from learning uh, or diving deeper into some of the areas then, and they stay as learning gaps. And that can cause fear for a person for whom learning is important to begin with. And that can be, you know, again, one of the factors in imposter syndrome as well. So not letting the learning compromises happen taking um, taking or like standing up for yourself or taking comfort in naming that, yeah, I am an independent learner. And yet at this point in time, I do need that training. I do need that support. I do need that added uh, sort of a bit here for myself. For presentations, uh, I won't go into details of the technicalities here yet. Um, like, you know, when I say technicalities, that's about like how to go about designing a good presentation and all. Again, flipping the lens here, though, that is useful for many people uh, besides holistic self-care. Um, the flipping the lens bit is it's not about me. So the spotlight then for presentation is not on you. It's about helping my audience. You're there to offer something to them. And yes, I've named um, some of the essential pointers here. What is needed for a presentation? Know your audience, know your material, structure your presentation, practice it, prepare it, and calm yourself from the inside. Easier said than done. The first five points, though, 
um, in this day and age, I would say if you go to Google or like any other AI support software that you have, you'll be able to see there are many like places out there. You'll be able to see like the detailed pointers for this. What does that mean? What, what do they mean by that? Um, I would want to focus for just a little bit on calming yourself from inside. And that also connects me to a point that I skipped around holistic self-care for interviews. Anxiety, again, is not just about doing something in the moment. Um, your sleep quality, your food quality, your exercise, your social connections. These four things are very important in order to change or shift anything around your bodily experiences. So focusing on also creating those healthy social connections, taking enough sleep, uh, eating the foods that you know have a certain impact on the body because it's all one in the same person, same system. The body and the thinking and the mind are not different entities by any means. Um, so yeah, just keeping an eye on the time. Uh, deliverables, short and long term. Again, um, over here, I would focus on the psychological or the uh, deeper pattern aspects of this, maybe more uh, perfectionism, uh, procrastination, if those are challenges that um, you navigate or you've been coping with. Uh, one of the things that I might share as a strategy if you're looking for one is giving yourself a set amount of time to do something, four hours, two hours, and like that's it, instead of having like that unlimited amount of time that you think you have. So maybe um, telling yourself that, all right, this is this is it. Um, I'm going to give myself uh, this much time to work on this and see um, what happens within that. Starting from that, ending in that, and that's, that's the task then. Because a lot of um, us, when we have... Uh, a huge amount of unstructured time. Uh, there might be delays around starting the task or completing the task. And then oftentimes a major chunk of that time gets occupied by just thinking around that task and uh, not being able to cater to uh, other uh, things that you need to. And this is not to ignore that a lot of people like prepare for things in their mind before they get to the paper and pen. So you know uh, what your learning styles are. Uh, again, um, take away things that seem useful, that seem applicable to you. This is uh, by no means minimizing the uh, people who spend a lot of time thinking before they get into the uh, action stage. An invitation, though, uh, that I do want to offer to uh, folks um, who don't feel an openness to facilitating their own systems or their own selves, organize and organizers. It is perfectly fine to put things to paper. It is perfectly fine to use all sorts of organizers to put your tasks uh, that need to be done out there and structure them. Uh, we don't have to expect ourselves, our minds, to just be able to do things. Uh, it's a bit of a trauma response, if I may, of absolute independence. I should just be able to do it just like that. Why do I need this sort of a facilitation or that sort of a facilitation? Uh, it should just happen. So again, slowing down, taking a step back and see how can you facilitate your system, the wiser, the bigger you, how can you um, actually uh, make it happen for yourself in a way that's less less jarring, less heavy on the system. Okay. Uh, all right, let's go to conference, meet and greet. I'll just quote uh, one example here. We've spoken about uh, speaking anxiety and um, you saw like a whole um, list of um, achievements that I put out there. I um, am sometimes hesitant doing that, but there were there were other reasons than just, you know, building credibility. Uh, it is there so that you see like, you know, why this might be a good use of your time. And yet it was also there to share uh, that just because somebody has a lot of achievements or a lot of degrees or specializations and like, you know, work experience across the globe and whatnot, um, it does not in any way mean that they have not gone through the same building competency process that we referred to uh, earlier on. Uh, so when we are meeting people 
um, conference meet and greet or other social scenarios where it's like you have to introduce yourself, notice the inner dialogue, inner voice uh, happening within. Um, now, I was able to um, pursue my master's in psychology from state uh, back in my early 20s and courtesy Fulbright Scholarship. Um, so I went there and I remember uh, sitting in this one of the events which was organized for Fulbright scholars, like, you know, we were meeting some community folks, some um, young school folks over there. And um, there was a discussion happening after which there was a chance of participants being invited to speak. And I remember very vividly thinking, oh my God. And I named it to my colleague as well, who was like a fellow full writer sitting there that I hope they don't ask me any question. And this is when I had not only written personal statements around things that I wanted to do for the country, I had solid student leadership experience. I was the president of the Multan Association of Psychology Students, the vice president the previous year. And a lot of like uh, leadership roles, a lot of uh, creative performances even. And yet, I'm sitting there and literally finding myself saying that uh, just an invite that, again, those processes, the healing journey, it can be linear. And that's just one example. Um, as we change places, there can be stuff from the past that comes back again. Um, and I've gone through those cycles many a time. Uh, so healing journey is not linear. Uh, just want to bring that to that open space here. It's if you find yourself uh, going back to a stage which you thought, you know, I'd already crossed it, that's, we have the same nervous system, same body that we use for all of our lives, uh, so to speak, not to sound simplistic here, yet the, the experiences and their impact is somehow stored right there. So it's, it's okay uh, to go through that and uh, take this as a cyclical process. And this takes me to one of the questions that somebody also asked about how can I be consistent? And my offering here, my invite here is to take the focus away from consistency and to focus on persistence. Consistency to me means staying in a certain habit set or being able to do something 24 seven, every day of the week, all days of the year. Persistence is more human and I invite persistence because then that's a long-term view of your own self, uh, of your own healing, and also a more compassionate and kind view, which means keep coming back to you wanting to do your work. Keep coming back uh, to uh, you, you know, focusing on the goals that you have, to the whys that you have. Why did you start, start something to begin with? Um, I hope that answers uh, for some of the folks there. At this point, I will again invite uh, you to do another second before we head towards the last slide, um, last topic also of our talk today. Uh, this is, I'm sharing this twice. Um, there are reasons for that. It's important to express your emotions and communicate your needs to trusted adults or friends. Sharing your feelings can help you feel better. So it's like naming it to tame it. Expanding vocabulary to actually talk about our own experiences from within. Being able to really see what's going on. And that takes the power uh, away from some of these emotions. Um, some of these feelings, they're, they're just pieces of information. They're there for us to listen to. Not all the emotions that come up have to be taken as orders, as we say. So it's something might feel like anger all the time. And yet when you dig deeper, you might be feeling disrespected at some point. At other point, you might be feeling numb or withdrawn. So like digging deeper, uh, making friends or like fitting with the feelings, um, it, it takes the power away in terms of like you feeling like you're compelled to follow it. It brings it to your, um, you know, um, again, brings you back to the driver's seat. At this point, uh, this is just a general sort of a sketch. I've noted the source here for the image as well. These are things that work for people in general. Um, Self-care, I would say, just invite you to see what works for you. 
Or what do you feel a readiness for? So in terms of personal self-care as well as professional self-care. And um, the webinar is being recorded. You can come back to it, uh, see what can go in your action plan uh, that you have taken with yourself. Um, and take it from there. It is perfectly fine to be starting from any of these points uh, at uh, this point in time. If you feel like connecting with me afterwards, uh, and if you feel like going to my Psychology Today profile, like the contact details are mentioned here, I offer online psychotherapy for adults and families and well-being consultancy for individuals and organizations. I work with people from across the globe, many cultures. I speak Urdu, Punjabi, and English fluently. Uh, those are the languages I use to offer services. And my specialization within the work is uh, developmental trauma or adults who have experienced unhealthy family environments or abuse or neglect um, over the years. Um, open to any questions uh, we may have at this point. Uh, and firstly, thank you so much for yes, bringing you. all of your parts here participants as well. Cool. So Saira, thank you. Thank you for joining today. And then I, I can say people have loved this session and people are loving it still. Uh, Thank you for those wonderful words and, you know, how you have put up things on your slides. Really, you know, amazing. So we, we have a few questions. I took some of them from the chat. People are also free to, you know, post them now. Uh, please use the Q&A uh, Q &A box uh, for our ease. Because if you put it in the chat, like it goes up and then you don't have to look for it. So let us start with some questions. Yeah. Uh, Aisha Ali is asking. How to concentrate on learning when we are anxious? I mean, I find it hard to concentrate on reading something even. Absolutely. Absolutely. And as I say, uh, there can be many uh, strategies around this. Uh, awareness, self-awareness would be the first one for me. Knowing what your learning style is. What sort of a learning environment works for you? Uh, do you know why, why your body is experiencing the anxiety? So it's, it's a very broad sort of an answer here in terms of uh, if somebody likes having music as the background, it helps them focus. For somebody else, it might be a distractor. So are we sure that our learning environment in which we are trying to read, that's okay. Is there something else that's needing attention? Is the anxiety actually drawing your attention to something? So maybe paying attention as we say, you know, listening to that part parking the anxiety somewhere and actually literally having a conversation with that part that I'll get back to you when I have time. And I wish we had a much longer time around it. We could go through the steps for this as well. Um, so yeah, try, try doing that too. And how's your, how's in general, um, your day in, day out looking like in terms of uh, sleep and food, as well as you um, taking care of your hobbies. Um, so how's, how's um, the quality of the 24 hours that we are living? Because as we say, you know, again, the, the holistic self-care is important here too. So I think that answers the question. Um, moving to the next one. Um, conscious competence is taking forever. Next step is not even close and making hard to move forward. How to keep the motivation high? Ah. A, anonymous attendee, I see when you say competence, conscious competence is taking forever. I don't want to assume feelings on your part. I hear frustration. I hear maybe anger with self. So that's my invitation to you. Notice how you are feeling towards this taking forever. And the next step, park it how you're feeling. And if this were again, you know, we could go through the steps of it. See if there's an openness to having curiosity and compassion towards that taking forever. That helps keep the motivation high. I hope I'm not moving too fast here in terms of answering. The second bit, very important one is to go back to your why, not how. The how will figure itself out. What you need to do, how to take the next step, how else to learn. I mean, you folks, uh, you, you know those things. Why? 
what was the reason? Uh, why did you start engaging with this learning process to begin with? The importance of that. I hope that's helpful. Uh, thank you, Saira. The next question we have is how to overcome personal relationship trauma and balance professional life. I wish I had a shorter answer for this. Uh, there can be a workshop around it. And uh, I don't think I can do justice to answering this right here um, in this space. However, I wonder uh, if you might find this helpful as to what is that experience meaning for you? So when you say personal relationship trauma and balancing professional life, is there something that's being carried over from that experience to how you show up in your professional life? Is there something that's starting to mean about you as a person that, oh, so I experienced this, that means I am so-and-so sort of a person or I have so-and-so qualities. I wonder if that can be helpful here. Thank you. Um, I think the next question relates to what you just told us. <clears throat> How to, uh, how to come across such a bad incident, or I think how to, yeah, how to uh, come across such a bad accident that has been happening during the childhood time. Could you repeat so, that, uh, Harith, for me? Yeah, so it's uh, how to, how to across, how to come across such a bad accident that has been happening during the I... childhood. Yeah, I know. Thank you for sharing that. I read that question here. My understanding is uh, that this person is trying to ask about healing from childhood experiences that have been happening in the childhood on repeated sort of basis. I would say a lot of the times sexual abuse, emotional abuse or physical abuse in the household or neglects of sorts could be happening in a repeated manner. They're not always one time incidents. Healing is a journey. Uh, healing is a journey. Don't hesitate to seek professional help, I would say. Don't hesitate to even talk about this as a first step among people that you feel safe with. Uh, this feeling of being isolated in some experiences can really keep people from inviting help. It can really actually start to mean uh, something about you as a person as well. So I do invite, you know, in the same way that you courageously posted this question over here, keep that openness and maybe start having these conversations with people that you trust um, and a professional psychotherapist, counseling therapist, uh, whenever you feel ready. Thank you, Saira. Uh, the next question is, how do we apply for a job in relation to our competences? Especially if I have the feeling that I cannot demonstrate my competences because no one has given me the opportunity to do so. A little experience. Very common struggle. And what's coming up for me at the moment is... Um, ignore this noise, folks. Um, in the background, I hope that's not creating a huge disturbance. But Johari window. I I wonder if we have heard about those four quadrants of Johari window, you know? So skills or things that you're aware of, uh, of about your own self. So there are some strengths that we sometimes grow up uh, knowing about our own self. So maybe our parents or our teachers or like people around us have reflected those back. And some people may not have had those experiences. So inviting feedback from others, uh, so this person, I'm assuming, maybe at some point they have looked at um, a job where they were like, oh, can I apply for this? Do I have this? And a lot of these jobs uh, do have like the skills mentioned that they're looking for. I would really invite you to start going to people, having conversations. Do you feel like um, I can somehow um, show that I have these skills. So inviting that feedback from others that know you in some capacity, maybe as a person, maybe as a fellow student, maybe as a fellow colleague or somebody that you share the university with even. 
Um, and sometimes even within those conversations, those thoughts can pop up. Uh, so not stopping at just our own inner reflection that's happening as we look at a job. Um, I just invite like, you know, getting that feedback from outside. And what happens over time is like, you hear it from enough number of people or you hear it from one credible source, sometimes we are able to put that into our own awareness of like, yeah, this is this is my skill set too. And I do want to go back also, Khaled, to restate here that, uh, you know, as I said, these things don't have to happen in a paid job scenario. There are so many opportunities uh, to show your competence, even in individual tasks as you are doing them in school or group tasks as, as you're doing them in school, not even college or university and things. Um, there is, it, it takes a lot of competencies to even engage in certain enrichment activities or sports or, uh, you know, other extracurriculars. So have those conversations. Uh, thank you, Sarah. So the next question is, uh, what about if one wants to take a comeback but is too afraid for that? No longer confident in what he, she was working on well in the past. Can you please guide in that way? Oh man, yeah. And this can be so many different scenarios, yeah. I'm thinking, you know, as I heard that question, some people would take maybe a maternity break. Um, you're you're having your family, having kids, and then trying to come, come back to a career, or you were exploring something else. You took a break for something that you were an expert in, again. Uh, I would go back to competencies being a cyclical process and for there to be an invitation to be kind to your own self around going through the cycle again so that then you can also offer the same kindness to people around you i cannot say this enough uh, to be honest because um, we as young people oftentimes do become these community leaders or like parents or like other sorts of mentors and leaders in our social circles and the same sort of kindness and compassion for the learning process has a trickle down effect. So yes, there will be parts that might feel shame um, or hesitancy around not being so good at something that you were just so used to being good at. Holding holding space for that, being able to sit with that, having having that contained in our systems, and then moving further. Openness to the natural cycle of competency again. And take help if it's needed, because with the kind of pace at which uh, things are evolving and developing, uh, it's a good thing as well. And yet, um, I would never want to assume that something that I learned four or five years ago would still be done in exact the same manner so maybe there are nuanced changes in which actual pd actual professional help can also help as you re-engage with the same supposedly profession thank you sir uh the next question is how to dominate a rational mind over emotional mind I hear the question, I take the question and I go like, how to, or do we have to? Because it's all within us. The rationality is from within. You know, as people sometimes say, oh, it's just emotions. It's just in your head. Okay, where do you think is the mathematical intelligence then? That's also just in the head. Where is the accounting intelligence? Where is the engineering intelligence? The physics and the social sciences and the art and the creativity. All of that is within us too. So uh, maybe if I hear the context from you here better, I might be able to take it in a different way yet. It's not this or that. It's the appropriateness of like, you know, so what's, what's better for you in the moment? So if, at the moment, you don't want to dig deep into the connecting the emotional mind or what you're saying is like, you don't want to be led by the impulses. Counterintuitive answer. Uh, it's going to happen by actually understanding that emotional bit better. As we say, it can seem like an impulse or just the anger and you want to rush into an action. 
if that's the context of this question and you're like, no, I want to take a rational decision. So what will help us in, for most of us in this scenario is not by running away from that emotional mind, by disengaging. What will help is by actually approaching and sitting with what's happening in that emotional space so that we name it, we develop awareness around it, we see exactly what's happening. Did it just need hearing or does it need more? So it's just like a, sometimes like a nagging child, you know, who will start, not stop poking, like we'll keep, keep trying to draw your attention. Oftentimes when we pay attention to the emotional mind really properly at a slow pace, we are able to take the power away from that impulsivity and make a more, as you say, a rational or a data-based or like a concrete sort of a decision that actually taking you, that takes you closer to your long-term goals, your vision of what you want out of uh, a certain scenario. Thank you, Saira. I would say this would be the last question we have taken. And then uh, I thank all the participants, you know, for staying till the end and, you know, asking those questions. I think uh, it was good to hear your thoughts and, you know, uh, Saira has beautifully answered them. If you have any more questions, I, uh, you can do reach out to her on her email or her social media accounts. Uh, I would say you must take a screenshot of this of the screen and then take it forward there. Also, this session is recorded and we will be uploading it on YouTube. So if you feel that you want to listen her back or you want to revisit the session and you know, uh, you could you could do that on our YouTube uh, channel. Uh, we will be releasing the video very soon. I'm just posting the link in the chat. Yeah, this is the link to our YouTube channel. Do subscribe and be updated about any activities we plan further. So Saira, is there anything you want to add? I just want to thank all the participants for such a beautiful, immersive engagement for asking those questions. That is um, awesome. It, it it tells me, you know, it, it's my feedback as well of sorts. Like, uh, I hope it was uh, helpful for folks who attended. And a massive, massive thanks to, you know, uh, GRSS, IEEE, and professionals, you folks, for like, arranging this. I I just wish you all the positivity in the universe and that you keep doing this like on an ongoing basis. There are many, many beneficiaries. You're helping many as well. So keep up the great work. Thank you, Sarah. And once again, thank you for joining us today. My pleasure. My pleasure, folks. Stay blessed.